jump through some really big ideas really quickly. There's another site that you talk about extensively in the book, and I'd like for us to bring up some pictures of that because it's going to tie into our story as well. Mm -hmm. Ganung Padang. Yes. I realize that this is an artist's rendition of what it would look like. This is in Indonesia. Yes, Tell but me it's, what based, this is. it's based on the very solid science and archaeological work. This is, um, this, this is a site called Gunung Padang in Indonesia. Uh, and as we can see from the artist's impression, it is a, a terraced pyramidal structure. Uh, what the, the, the problem with Gunung Padang is that for a very long time, people believed that it was just a natural hill with a, an old but not extremely old old megalithic site on top of it. And that megalithic site that's been in plain view and was in fact first inspected by archaeologists as early as 1914, uh, that megalithic site has long been thought, although not on very good evidence, to be about 2,500 years old. What nobody considered, nobody in the archaeological community considered, was what might be lying below what's on the surface. And we owe our knowledge of that uh, to uh, geologists. This is the, the, the surface view, part of the pyramidal structure covered with a relatively recent megalithic site. Uh, but a, a leading geologist in Indonesia, whose name is Dr. Danny Hillman Natuwajaja, uh, who is actually um, in Indonesia's leading expert in megathrust earthquakes. He's, he's a very serious, massively trained, you know, hugely professional geologist. He, he got his PhD at Caltech here, here in the United States. Um, when he visited Gunung Padang, he, ma he made a visit there simply because he wanted to see the megalithic site. And then he started looking at it as a geologist. And he started to suspect that the hill upon which this site was standing was no hill, that this was a pyramid, uh, that it had structural elements to it, and that something very important had been overlooked here. So he brought together a team of, of geological specialists uh, and they brought a, a vast amount of equipment to the site so that they could look inside the structure without actually damaging it. And they used ground penetrating radar for that purpose, but also seismic tomography, electrical resistivity, and other techniques that can be used to give you a sense of exactly what's inside this structure. And what they found to be inside the structure was a, a series of hidden chambers, one of them very large, a large rectangular chamber buried about 100 feet deep uh, inside, inside this pyramid. Uh, there's in fact three of these chambers and, and absolutely irrefutable evidence that the whole structure from bottom to top is man-made. And what we're looking at on the surface is just the latest structure to be, put on that, to be put on that site. They then went further and they brought along a couple of tubular drills and they put down the drills into the site and they brought up what are called drill cores right. from the great, uh, great depths of the site. And what they brought up were a um, mixture of worked stone, man-made stone that had been cut by human beings that with clear jointing, putting together the stones, a mixture of that and organic material that was datable. And the datable organic materials put the origin of this site back to 20,000 years ago, back into the depths of the last ice age when Indonesia was a very different place. It was a huge continent-sized landmass, not a series of islands near the Malaysian Peninsula, but a giant now lost continent that was submerged beneath the waves in that cataclysm that occurred between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And this site stands on the high land that was, never, that was never inundated. So we really badly need to know what is inside those chambers. The, the, the sad uh, sequel to the Gobekli Tepe story is that the, the work on the site has now been stopped for the best part of a year. At Gobekli Tepe? Uh, sorry, at Gunung Padang. Okay. The work at, uh, sorry, did I say Gobekli Tepe? The work at Gunung Padang has been stopped for a year. Um, after uh, initially getting approval from the Indonesian government to begin an excavation, there was a change of leadership in Indonesia. The new president came in and he listened to complaints from archaeologists who didn't like the fact that geologists were doing the work and didn't feel the work should be done, as a matter of fact. They felt that the budget given to the excavation of Gunung Padang should be given instead to their pet projects. And this whole thing has just stopped the excavation in its tracks. And we're hoping very much, I'm in daily contact with, with Danny in Indonesia, 
Indonesia. We're hoping very much that they will get permission to continue and find out what the hell is inside those chambers, those hidden chambers deep in this mysterious 20,000 year old man-made pyramid that's sitting there in Indonesia. And it's an interesting thing. The name is Gunung Padang, okay? In the Indonesian language, and many people think that's what the name is in, uh, that means mountain field, which doesn't sound like much. But when you go into the Sundanese language, and this is in the area where the Sundanese language is spoken, you find that it means mountain of enlightenment, and that there is an ancient tradition of wisdom associated with this place. And that's why the relatively recent megalithic site is sitting on the top of it. It's honoring and respecting, overbuilding upon the earlier site, which is the source of that name, Mountain of Enlightenment. Which we see in, 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 in numerous um, sacred sites where they build each era tends to build on top of another, it's, it's so the deeper you go. It's an almost universal theme, yeah. It's an almost universal theme, and it can be, it can be confusing for, for archaeology. And there's sure. a, there's a, I feel that we, we now, in the light of this new evidence, we need to reconsider quite a number of megalithic sites around the world and consider whether, whether in fact, we're, we're, we're looking at a, a, a process and whether the dates given to those sites is a, is a falsely young date. This is very much the case, and I go into it in depth in Magicians of the Gods, in the Andes, for example, in Peru, where many megalithic monuments that archaeology has handed over uncritically and without question to the Incas and said that the Incas make them, uh, the evidence is overwhelming on the ground that the Incas did not make them. And they even say so themselves. And they say so themselves, that some former civilization of the gods had made these sites and that they honored and respected them by building around and over them and, and trying to mimic the style, although they never succeeded quite in doing so. So there's, there's this earlier megalithic lair, some of which is just totally stunning, uh, and this is true all over the world, then overbuilt by later cultures, and the mistake is to put the date to the later culture rather than to the earlier culture that founded the site. Understood, and not to bag on archaeologists too much, but listen, you make this point in the book, and uh, Danny, not a Jawawa, I, I, not to judge you. I, I, I apologize, I'm not sure I pronounced the name correctly. You make this point that he feels that archaeologists is archaeology is a very imprecise science. Absolutely, D Danny comes at this as a scientist. His his interest is data, which is amusing to me yeah. and probably truthful. Yeah, it's, it is truthful. I, I I don't think that archaeology qualifies as a science. It's not it's not a science. It's it's about the interpretation often according to the particular philosophy that the individuals hold, the interpretation of often very scarce and very slim data on the, on, on the ground. And actually, the, the further back you go into the past, the slimmer the data becomes. Uh, and the more speculation is built into the archaeological model. And in this sense, archaeology, I would say, is misleading the public. It's, it's, uh, perhaps it's not deliberate, but it's, a, it's the suggestion that, uh, that they have the facts about the past, when again and again the next turn of the archaeologist's spade changes the model entirely and, and, and comes up with sites that cannot be explained by the existing model of the origins of civilization. And that's what both Gunung Padang in Indonesia and Gobekli Tepe in Turkey are. They're sites that don't fit in to the existing picture. And, and what archaeology needs to do, I think, is to modify their theory of the past in the light of the new facts. That would be good science, but the tendency at the moment, sadly, is to reject the new facts as simply impossible because they don't fit in with the theory. And that's the opposite of good science. That's Absolutely. really bad science. Well, you, you have made mention before of this term, the knowledge filter. And yeah. I've heard you even say that you wondered if it was the same in other in other, other fields of, yeah. but I need to emphasize, by the way, the term is not mine. That's oh. the term of Michael Cremo, uh, who wrote an amazing book called Forbidden Archaeology. Absolutely. And, and, and points out that there's some, some knowledge that's such dynamite for the existing view of things that it literally gets filtered out. It, just, it, we never, it never reaches the public. Well, and you make the point that the way that is able to occur is people and their careers and their tenure and all of these things and their finances is, and their ego yes. is tied up in this uh, dogmatic feeling they have towards their beliefs, which leaves them unable to make these changes when things like this pop up, yeah. which leaves it to gentlemen like yourself. Well, it means, it means that, and it's often been the case when there have been re revolutions in ideas, that it takes somebody who's marginal to the field to, to, to bring that information. And the, I'm or not, outside, because I wouldn't outside use the marginal. Yeah, I'm outside, I, I'm, I'm, you know, a, a journalist, actually. Yes. I don't claim to be a, an 
ar archaeologist. I, I don't claim to be a, a scientist. My, my, my job is to synthesize data across an enormous area. And, and what that means is that I may be looking at data that archaeologists are not looking at at all. Uh, for the moment, archaeologists are not interested in and apparently completely unaware of the fact that an extinction level cataclysm took place on this planet between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, right in the foundations of the edifice of history that they have built. But they've built their edifice of history without taking account of this extinction level event in its foundations. And that surely has to shake everything up. The, the, the possibility that the myths of a former golden age, which are universal, which are worldwide, of a great civilization with almost magical powers, which was destroyed in a global cataclysm involving flood and fire, uh, the possibility that these myths are true now must be taken extremely seriously in the light of the two factors, the evidence, the firm scientific evidence for a massive extinction level global cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, and archaeological sites that are coming out of the woodwork that cannot be explained by the existing model of history. This is shaking everything up. And this is the reason I've written this book, as a matter of fact. Let's bring up that photo of the younger Dryas, because this is the time we need to segue into the background and explain what this is, because a large part of this book is about this period in time yes. of the younger Dryas. Yes. And some of my audience may know what it is, yeah. many may not. Explain briefly what we're talking about, because this it's is a, critical to the understanding of the whole thing. It's a phenomenon that's been known about for many decades. We have very good climate records of the last ice age and of the last 20,000 years. And here's, the, here's how it was, that the peak of the last ice age was about 21,000 years ago. The world was at its coldest, uh, the ice sheets were at their deepest, covering most of the northern half of North America, most of the northern half of northern Europe. And then, slowly, the climate began to warm, and the ice sheets began to thin out a bit. Not a lot. They were still very much intact by 12,800 years ago, but they were less, substantially less than they had been 20,000 years ago. And then, as, just as the world is going into this nice warming trend, there's a sudden radical change in climate. And, and climate, the, the, the temperature drops massively. And we see that, that spike here, where above the letters YD, as the, 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 the global temperature just plunges to, to as cold as it was at the coldest point of the Ice Age. And this episode lasts for 1,200 years, from 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. And then equally mysteriously, global temper, temperature rockets up. Uh, rockets up again. Uh, I mean, these changes in temperature are, are gigantic. Any modern talk of, of global warming, and let's set aside all the issues around that, any modern talk of global warming is just peanuts. It's just a tiny, tiny little blip by comparison with what happened during the Younger Dryas. And the other thing that we know happened during the Younger Dryas was that there were massive global extinctions of animal species, although the epicenter of these extinctions was in the Americas, particularly in North America. It was a, it was a global problem. So s clearly something very, very bad happened. And this, this attracted the attention of, of a group of very major mainstream scientists, uh, earth scientists, geologists mainly, who were trying to get to the bottom of this. Why did this sudden climate shift happen? What caused it to happen? Uh, and they began to investigate. They began to look at the earth. They began to look at the stratum of soil that goes back to that period. And what they found in that stratum from 12,800 years ago was a thick layer of soot which is evidence of continent-wide wildfires. And embedded in and just below the soot, they found a number of very specific things. They found nanodiamonds, tiny, tiny diamonds that are only visible under a microscope. They found melt glass, which is basically trinitite, the stuff that, that you know, we, we, we saw after the first nuclear, nuclear explosions on, on Earth, the evidence of enormous heat, um, ca carbon spherules, a, a layer of iridium in, in the soil. All of these we know already from previous research, research, for example, done on the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we know already that these are the sure and certain signs of a cosmic impact. Nothing else can cause them. Nothing else can cause temperatures in excess of the boiling point of quartz across 50 million square miles of the Earth's surface. And that's what we're finding uh, in the Younger Dryas boundary, this layer of soil which marks the end of one period and the beginning of another and it was a cataclysmic end and so 
they realized that there had been a cosmic impact. It hadn't been noticed before. Nobody had found any crater. Normally craters are what we look for uh, right. if we're dealing with a cosmic, and nobody had found one. But now we know why initially craters were not found. This is the area uh, where the evidence for the Younger Dryas impact has, has come from. See, comets, the, uh, the, I have to cut to the chase. Yeah, absolutely. We're dealing with a comet here. We're dealing with a giant comet. The evidence is now in. This is a comet that would have been in the range of 100 to 200 kilometers in diameter, which entered the inner solar system from deep space about 20,000 years ago. It was captured by the sun and went into an orbit that crosses the orbit of the Earth. As comets often do, it began to break up into multiple fragments, some of them very large, some of them quite small. Some of them a kilometer in diameter, some of them a meter in diameter, some of them just dust and debris, some of them huge rocks. And what happened was at least four of those rocks as the Earth was crossing the path of the comet. The debris, as the comet begins to break out, spreads up right along the orbit of the comet. And as the Earth was passing through the orbit of the comet, at least four of those large chunks in the range of one to two kilometers of, in diameter entered the Earth's atmosphere and smacked into what was then the North American ice cap. 12,800 years ago, it was still a couple of kilometers deep. And, and so the craters were excavated in ice, yes. and they were transient. As the ice melted away in the enormous shock and heat created by these impacts, as the ice melted away, the craters vanished. That's not the complete story, though, because in, within the last year, the evidence for craters has begun to be found. Right at the edge of the North American ice cap, there are a number of craters, the Cor Corosol Crater, the Bloody Creek structure, and so on, that are now firmly associated with this event. And there is evidence of shock effects on the ground under the ice cap. So the impacts were huge enough to shock the ground beneath that two kilometer deep ice. Uh, and, and, and now the case has gone from being an argument among scientists to being just about as close to absolutely defined fact as it's possible to get in science. We were hit by fragments of a giant comet 12,800 years ago, and it changed everything. And this, I believe, was the cataclysm which lost us a whole civilization and knocked us on the head as a species and made us uh, a species with amnesia. And the story's not over, because 12,800 years ago, the Earth goes into this hell regime of the Younger Dryas, dreadfully freezing cold, animal extinctions everywhere. Last 1,200 years, and then we shoot out into warmer climates. That's also further fragments of the same comet. Again, the Earth crosses their path. They plow into the atmosphere. This time, they hit ocean. And, and the, effect, uh, the effect is to throw an enormous amount of water vapor up into the upper atmosphere uh, and create a greenhouse effect, which causes the very rapid warming that occurred at that time and was, of course, accompanied by enormous tidal waves and, and global floods 11,600 years ago. That is the date for the foundation of Gobekli Tepe, and that is the date that Plato gave us long ago for the destruction of the lost civilization of Atlantis. Now, Kaching. <laughs> Kaching. archaeologists have been in the habit of laughing at the Atlantis story and dismissing it and coming up with all kinds of fantasies that Plato made it up for some sort of political purpose. He invented it. But Plato said very clearly that this was a, a disaster uh, which originated in events in the sky uh, and that it resulted in a massive flood which submerged, destroyed and submerged a huge island on which the continent of the, 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 the civilization of Atlantis existed existed. And that this happened, he says it clearly, in black and white, that it happened 9,000 years before the time of Solon. And Solon was Plato's own ancestor who had visited Egypt in 600 BC and there had learnt the story of Atlantis. And 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago, which is the date of that second spike which was accompanied by global flooding uh, and where suddenly and mysteriously we see the evidence for a transfer of technology at places like Gobekli Tepe, the survivors of the lost civilization coming there and attempting to restart their civilization. I don't think they succeeded, but you can see the, the fingerprints. You can see that effort was made the, the, and agriculture stayed with us. We learned agriculture from these people and it passed on from them. And that was the beginning of the story. That's the beginning of the story of civilization is actually a re-beginning. It's a starting again after a global cataclysm. One thing